Bonjour tout le monde. Hi everyone. My name is Rachel Bandayan. I'm the Member of Parliament for Outremont here at the House of Commons and I'm actually the only Sephardic member to sit in the chamber and it's with a huge sense of responsibility and honour that I represent the Sephardic community here um, in our House of Commons. I also want to acknowledge and, and thank, as I do and I did last year, um, Jacques Seda, who is the previous Sephardic member of parliament and was, of course, minister um, for liberal government and uh, continues to be a wonderful leader for the Sephardic community across Canada. Um, let me also thank B'nai B'rith and in particular CEO Michael Mostein for organizing this event, which I feel is incredibly important and I hope the annual event continues its beautiful tradition. I'd like to share with you a little bit about my story uh, and the story of my family. You see, in the 1960s, a lot of Jews were leaving Morocco and um, unfortunately, my family was one of them. There were 300,000 Jews living in Morocco at the time. Today, there's 2,500. And that exodus is the story of so many Jews and, and so many different countries across the Arab world and in Iran who were forced to leave um, their country of birth in order to find a new home. I grew up uh, in Montreal, of course, listening to my father tell stories of what it was like back in those days. You see, he was only a teenager at the time and uh, he told me that he and his family had to make a difficult choice. There were boats leaving every day. He was part of a movement helping Jews leave the country with nothing but the valuables that they could carry with them on their back. And there were boats leaving to Canada, but also to France and to Israel. And while many, many families picked Israel, my family chose to come to Canada. My mother's family, uh, that also of course chose Canada as their homeland, uh, left a bit earlier and my mother was only one years old. So she doesn't have memories of, of Morocco like my father does, but uh, memories of a welcoming country that uh, brought her family in and ensured that they had everything they needed to be successful in their new country. And I think that that's a beautiful story, of course, but we also need to remember that there are you know, important moments in time where there was an exodus of Jews leaving uh, Arab countries, leaving um, their country of origin in order to find a new home. And that exodus is, I think, uh, unfortunate. There are so many reasons why, you know, Jewish families right around the world and need to find a new home. And, and that particular moment of our history is something that we should remember and learn from. I am incredibly privileged, of course, to be here today to address all of you, and I hope that there will be many more speakers that will share their own personal stories. For my part, I'd like to thank again B'nai B'rith and the Jewish community that continues to recognize the importance of our Sephardic heritage, and on that note, I'd like to thank you and say a bientôt. Hi. My name is Mark Gold. I'm the government representative in the Senate. I'm pleased to offer these few words on this day to mark the departure and expulsion of Jews from Arab countries in Iran, also known as Jewish Refugee Day. This day brings to light the story, not universally known, of the almost one million Jews who were forced to leave their homes to escape discrimination and persecution. And it's also the story of how these refugees found new homes all around the world including here in Canada, building new lives for themselves and for their children and contributing greatly uh, to our country. I salute their courage, their resilience and their commitment. They enrich and inspire us all. Hi, I'm Melissa Lansman, Member of Parliament for Thornhill and Deputy Leader of the Conservative Party of Canada. And I'd like to start off by thanking Bene Brith for the invitation to speak today and share a few thoughts with you. But more than that, I want to thank you for your relentless advocacy on behalf of Jews and Zionism every single day and working to end anti-Semitism once and for all. Unfortunately, the issues of Jews in the Middle East is often overlooked, even forgotten. And that speaks to how devastating persecution in those nations was. Over 850,000 Jews being forced to flee their communities, their belongings and their families, never to be compensated. 
shining a light on these injustices is both imperative and a sober reminder that vigilance against discrimination and anti-Semitism is our duty as the Jewish people. We see that time and time again that the burden lies with those who choose principle over popularity and not picking the persecution that conveniently fits in a narrative that sometimes excludes Jews. That's why B'nai B'ris efforts today and the contribution of today's guest speakers are so important. The Middle East is not a safe place for Jews, even after all of these years. A history of persecution has been given new lifeblood in the world's casual dismissal of discrimination against the state of Israel, the rightful home of the Jewish people in the Middle East. It's under threat today. This, of course, is calculated, deliberate, and accepted by too many democracies around the world. The government of Canada has a role to play. It matters what we say. It matters what we do. And that means standing up to countries like Iran that want to see a world without Israel and a country without the basic rights for minorities and today anyone who doesn't adhere to the weaponization of religion. Canada should be a leader in the protection of religious freedom, human rights, and a champion of those persecuted by the most dangerous regimes in the world. We're not there yet, but I promise that I will be your strongest supporter in Parliament. Because it's just too important not to be. If we don't know where we stand in this country on rights, it's hard to imagine a future where those very same rights are protected here. Thank you for using your voices and your platform to bring attention to this critical issue. I want to encourage you to continue your efforts. And on behalf of our whole community, thank you. Until then, know that you will have a com com my complete and total support as the Member of Parliament for Thornhill and from the entire Conservative family. Thanks. Jewish communities have existed in the Middle East for over 2,500 years. When the Babylonian king destroyed Jerusalem and the Temple in 586 BCE, he exiled about 90% of the population of the Kingdom of Judah to Babylon, today's southern Iraq. 47 years later, some Jews returned to Judah, while others chose to remain in Babylon and Persia. Jews lived in other Middle Eastern countries as well, including Egypt, Syria, and today's Turkey, Arabia, and Yemen. When the Romans destroyed Jerusalem and the Second Temple in 70 CE, many more Jews were forced to leave Judea. The Babylonian Jewish community became the leading community in the Jewish world. For the next 500 years, the Middle East and North Africa were ruled by two powers, the Roman Empire in the West and the Persian Empire in the East. Periods of relative stability for the Jewish community alternated with times of rigid restrictions and persecutions. In 632, a new power appeared in the Middle East. From today's Saudi Arabia, Arab armies spread throughout the region, eager to bring their new religion, Islam, to the world. This quick conquest brought many diverse populations, including Christians, Zoroastrians, and Jews, together in one new empire. The Muslim authorities now face the question of how to deal with the many non-Muslims in their vast empire. Although they promised to protect the life and possessions of their non-Muslim subjects, Muslim authorities implemented several policies to remind the non-Muslims of their second-class status, such as prohibiting them from building a house of worship or holding religious possessions. The world of Islam and the position of non-Muslims changed little until the 19th century, when, thanks to increased European influence, the Ottoman Sultan abolished Dhimmi restrictions and made all inhabitants of his empire equal citizens, whether they were Muslim, Christian, or Jewish. Christian missionaries and others established schools throughout the Ottoman Empire. These schools taught a Western curriculum, turning out Jewish and Christian students who held positions in trade and government. Traditional Muslims resented the equal rights and social and economic successes of the inferior non-Muslims, with resulting tensions leading to anger and violence and occasional anti-Jewish and anti-Christian riots. Towards the end of the 19th century, the Arab Awakening, or Nada, further isolated the Jewish community. Although Christian Arabs played a leading role in the revival of Arabic language and literature, there was a strict division along ethnic and religious lines in Arab countries. The emerging Arab nationalism did not include the Jews. Instability grew in the Middle East after World War I. The fall of the Ottoman Empire was widely welcomed, but the Arab Muslim population resented British and French colonial domination, leading to a rise in Arab nationalism. The British 1917 Balfour Declaration and the promise of a Jewish homeland delighted the Jews. 
However, to appease the Arab population, the British government backed down from its commitment to a Jewish homeland. In Palestine, increased Jewish immigration led to deadly riots in the 1920s. While the conflict was initially considered a local dispute between Jewish and Arab inhabitants of Palestine, from the 1920s onward, the Arab world saw the conflict as between Jews and Muslims, with severe consequences for Jewish communities in the Middle East. In Syria, Jews felt compelled to demonstrate against Zionism. In Iraq, Jews claimed to denounce Zionism. In Algeria, rioters killed dozens of Jews and wounded many others. Hitler's rise to power in the 1930s widened the gap between Middle Eastern Jews and their Arab neighbors. The Arabs loathed the British and French imperialist policies in the Middle East. Because France and England were Germany's enemies, the Arabs sided with Hitler. Mein Kampf, published in Arabic without its anti-Arab passages, was widely read. In Iraq, Jews were now considered the enemy within, resulting in the Farhud, a murderous riot which broke out in Baghdad in 1941. Things were dire for Jews across North Africa, where German and Italian forces rounded up Libyan and Tunisian Jews and deported them to labor camps. Algerian Jews had their French citizenship revoked. The end of the Second World War did not bring peace or normalcy for the Jews in Arab countries. In 1945, there were anti-Jewish riots in Egypt. In Libya, more than 130 Jews were killed and 4,000 lost their homes. Jews understood the Nazi sympathies of many of their Arab neighbors and its destructive potential. The lessons of the Holocaust were clear. Most Europeans did not help their Jewish neighbors, and Western countries did not open their borders to save Jewish refugees. The lack of allies in the Muslim world and in Europe caused Jews in Arab countries to strengthen their connection to their Jewish identity and Jews in other lands. On November 29, 1947, the UN voted in favor of the partition of the British Mandate into a Jewish and an Arab state, sealing the fate of the Jews in Arab countries. Anti-Jewish riots broke out throughout the Arab world. In Yemen alone, 82 were killed and 170 shops were destroyed. On May 14, 1948, Ben-Gurion established the State of Israel. Five Arab countries, Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, and Iraq, immediately declared war. There was little to no hope that Jews could remain in Arab countries. According to a Canadian Parliament official report, in 1948, there were 856,000 Jews living in Arab countries. By 2012, there were fewer than 5,000. This mass exodus took various forms. Tens of thousands of Jews were evacuated and flown to Israel. Other communities left as individuals and families in fear for their safety. In Iraq and Egypt, Jews had their citizenship revoked and property confiscated. And in Syria, Jews could often only leave in secret. Between 1949 and 1950, Operation Magic Carpet transported 47,000 Yemenite Jews to Israel. Between 1949 and 1951, 114,000 Iraqi Jews flew to Israel. Another 20,000 left the country illegally. By 1951, 30,000 Libyans had flown to Israel. Another 8,000 Jews from Libya fled to Italy. The Suez Crisis signaled the end for the Jews in Egypt. 30,000 Jews saw their citizenship revoked with a stamp in their passports. Don't come back. After the outbreak of the Civil War in Algeria, 125,000 Jews left for France. The Moroccan Jewish community was the largest in the Arab world in 1948, with 265,000 members. Today, fewer than 3,000 Jews live in Morocco. Iran is not an Arab country, and it was not included in the Canadian parliamentary inquiry. However, at the outbreak of the Islamic Revolution in 1979, there were 80,000 Jews in Iran. Today, estimates suggest fewer than 9,000 remain. Thank you for having me today. And uh, please allow me first to start our, uh, our talk with uh, remembering the 58 children who are killed by the Islamic regime of Iran just the last few days and show our support and solidarity with the courageous Iranian people who are, um, you know, bravely fighting the child killer regime for their lives and for their liberty. 
Uh, Iranian Jews uh, constitutes as one of the world's oldest and uh, historically most significant Jewish community. Many think that the existence of Jews in Iran goes back uh, to the Cyrus the Great. Uh, but in fact, uh, Jews has another two major waves uh, before, before that, meaning it goes back to 2,700 years ago. Uh, Jews uh, have deep roots in Iran. Um, I can say that after Israel, Iran has the highest number of holy Jewish sites, Jews in Pahlavi era and more precisely in 60s and 70s experience a prosperous life together with religious and cultural liberty. Um, this, the, the, you know, uh, during a Shah, the government aimed to create uh, a, a homogeneity among Iranians by emphasizing on national identity as Iranians, uh, despite their different uh, religious or ethnic background, which after the revolution is drastically changed by naming Shia Islam as the main factor of Iran's identity in the Islamic constitution. So before the revolution, Iran, um, I can say about around 100,000 Jews were, uh, were in Iran. But um, Islamic revolution and wave of anti-Semitism, anti-Israel sentiments, targeting Jews, confiscating of their properties, and even execution of a few uh, key leaders of the Jewish community force uh, Jews to leave their country and immigrate to the other countries like United States, mainly in United States, and then Israel and few uh, other European countries. Uh, what we are witnessing in Iran these days started then. The, the demonstration started in Tehran uh, in 1999 uh, against the closure of a reformist newspaper. But it was not limited to that. People shouting for the regime change even then. The target was uh, the supreme leader. Uh, he appeared uh, on the national TV on the fifth day, crying while we he spoke about his photographs being torn. So unfortunately, that time there was no internet and social media uh, for people to he hear about it or learn about it. Not so many people heard about what was happening in Iran those days, um, but. That was one of the, you know, I think, uh, start, uh, point of, uh, start point for many oppositions who still had faith in reforms. That was the end of, uh, end of it. So they saw that Khatami, the uh, reformist president, uh, took the supreme leader's side instead of supporting those who voted for him. He himself or ordered attacking and arresting the leaders of the movement. So um, that was uh, what happening um, in Iran those days. We joined the uh, uprising right away and played some major role during the five day uprising, which caused arresting and torturing a few of our members. Of French. course, as a Jew, uh, the situation could be much worse for me while uh, my friends were detained, they were asked to write about me and my involvement. Uh, although not so many were aware of my trip to Israel a few months earlier, they were asked to write about it in detail. So when I heard about it and my family and find it out, I couldn't take a risk. I was sure if they come after me, they would link me to Israel. And I was not wrong after um, after I left, and since then, I was targeted uh, by IRGC a few times, calling me linkage between uh, Mossad and CIA. And in the recent att attempts, uh, out of desperation, they call me the Zionist leaders of the movement as one of their tactic tactics to drag the attention from the leadership of young people in the streets of Iran to abroad. And uh, as I wrote and talk about it many times for the last few months, um, what people are demanding today is not different from all uh, movements starting in 1999. Uh, it only became more radical. 
women in Iran were always in on front line, but this time they started it. Uh, it this movement started with courageous women, uh, even school uh, students are involved. Uh, what we are witnessing today is a revolution, despite what some media outlets are trying to demonstrate as women movement. This time, all Iranians, despite their ethnicity, religious, linguistic, and, and gender differences, became united. Unity is the key to Iranian success, and the regime is aware of that. Uh, for the last uh, four decades, they followed the divide and rule policy to isolate citizens into different religious, ethnic, gender, and even linguistic groups. So um, if you ask me what's going to happen, I would tell you that it's not clear when this regime go, but it is obvious that they will go. And um, together we can make it happen. So I was born in the city of Tangiers in Morocco. Uh, Tangiers is part of uh, Spanish Morocco, um, had a very, very rich culture. Um, and uh, I was five years old when my family uh, decided to move from Morocco, from Tangiers um, to Canada. They had wonderful, uh, wonderful relationships. Um, you know, the Jewish community in, in Tangiers thrived. I think it was true of many communities and most communities in Morocco. I don't remember my parents ever uh, speaking of open anti-Semitism. Um, of ever living under circumstances that they felt uncomfortable living in Morocco. Um, I think it was, you know, so I can't really say that that was the reason. In other words, that there was any specific event that caused my parents to leave. I think it was an overall kind of impression, um, you know, and uh, what they heard on, you know, the streets of other countries, other countries that, you know, Jews lived uh, in Arab countries. And I think that that impression um, with time kind of created the, the uh, uh, idea amongst many of the Jews of Morocco that, you know, it's just a matter of time. So we, we might as well leave now. We might as well, you know, get out now while, while things are still okay. Um, and, you know, so I think that's, you know, when my, my parents, and I think this is true of many Jews of Morocco in general, they speak very fondly of life in Morocco. There's kind of like a nostalgia about their life there and the beauty of life there, how they got along with their neighbors there, you know, the customs, the streets and so on. Um, and so um, there, there is this really positive kind of nostalgic feeling that a lot of Jews of Morocco have. Well, my father came to Winnipeg um, as the shochet of the community, the ritual slaughterer. Um, and he was the shochet in the community. He was the mohel in the community um, for many, many years. Um, so when we came to Winnipeg, the year was 1963, and uh, the first synagogue we lived in, uh, we lived in the north end of the city. Um, our first home was uh, on Alfred Avenue. There was a very, very famous synagogue. It still actually is functioning today, known as the Ashkenazi Shul. <laughs> so the name already yes, kind yeah. of tells it all. Uh, but, uh, you know, that was the closest synagogue, and it was the first Shabbat that uh, that we were here. My father, of course, going to synagogue was very important to him throughout his life, and we went to the Ashkenazi Shul. It was one of those classic old Winnipeg synagogues where you had all of these, you know, old Jews who were just like the typical Winnipeg Jews. Um, and, uh, of course, they all spoke Yiddish. Um, they didn't call it Yiddish. They called it Jewish. In other words, for them, your whole Jewish identity was tied into the language, the Yiddish language. Um, and, uh, of course, they were very, very curious. Um, all of a sudden, the shoichet, uh, the, the new shoichet arrives in Winnipeg. And um, I remember after the services, all of the Jews, all of these old Jews, they crowded around my father. They wanted to, you know, get to know who is this new shoichet who just came to the community. But they started to speak to him in Yiddish. And my poor father uh, didn't understand a single word. My father was fluent in Hebrew. In fact, he was a Hebrew teacher in Morocco. 
um, and he was actually an expert in the Hebrew language. And uh, he answered to them and he said, I don't, I don't know what you're saying. I don't understand this language. This language is very foreign to me. And they were shocked. They couldn't believe that he was actually Jewish. How could it be possible that he's Jewish and he doesn't speak Jewish? Um, and so uh, that was, you know, kind of a, you know, a, an interesting first uh, uh, encounter with the Jewish community of Winnipeg. But I have to say that with time, um, they came to accept my father very, very well. And, uh, you know, our family very, very well. And we, you know, became part of the framework and the tapestry of the uh, Jewish community of Winnipeg. The, the traditions were very, very strongly ingrained in our home. Uh, my parents had, you know, a very, very strong sense of of identity, Jewish identity, but also identity and cultural identity from Morocco. And so growing up in our home, um, we ate all the traditional Moroccan foods. We had traditional Moroccan customs. My father would teach us, you know, many of the traditional melodies, for example, the Kiddush on Friday night or Havdalah, uh, holidays on Pesach, the chanting of the Haggadah in the Moroccan melody. Um, we had many, many, uh, we used to celebrate Mimuna on the end of Pesach between all of our families, a very, very famous Moroccan uh, ritual of going from home to home at the end of Pesach to eat, you know, the first chametz, to eat the traditional foods. There was mufleta, which is uh, kind of like a pancake. Uh, my aunt uh, used to make it and we'd go from one house to the other. So yeah, we lived in this very large Ashkenazi community, but within our little bubble, we still managed to maintain, uh, uh, you know, a very, very rich set of customs, traditions, uh, music, uh, food, um, you know, from our Moroccan heritage. My mother was born in Libya in a small town called Homs or El Homs, El Kums. I'm not sure exactly how they pronounce it today. She used to call it Homs. Um, she was born uh, in 1929 or 1933. It's uh, unclear. Um, I know that at the end of uh, World War II, there were about 30,000 uh, Jews living in, uh, in Libya. From, my, from what I know, my grandfather had a, like a restaurant coffee shop something like that and he was also producing lechbi which is like a date um, dates um, juice or something and uh, yeah and he was the main uh, supporter of the family I know that they had some land uh, but um, during uh, World War II, when the Brits and, and the French and the Italians were uh, uh, at war, um, the town was bombed and he uh, you know, had to close his restaurant and run home and he was, uh, he was in distress and he fell and he had concussion and he died. Uh, so the four, girl, the four girls were left with uh, their, my grandmother and her mother uh, without really a source of income or um, a male protector, you have to understand. Um, they lived in a, you know, in a very uh, male uh, controlled um, society. So they didn't really have anyone to take care of them. So they, they had to uh, go out and work. My, my aunt used to be a, a nurse, so she was helping as a nurse. And uh, the rest of the girls with my mom in included were busy um, um, washing clothes to all kinds of soldiers that, uh, that came to town and needed uh, washing services. So that's how they survived. Okay, well, obviously when the Germans came, uh, there, was, uh, there was no mercy on, on the Jews. And the story goes that they went, some German soldiers went from house to house looking for Jewish girls to rape. And uh, I know that they came into my mother's house and, uh, and I know that they were looking for girls to rape. 
Uh, the story goes that my aunt took her broom and, you know, chased them away, although it's hard to believe that a broom will chase away uh, Nazi soldiers. Uh, so when that happened, they all had to run away and hide for a while. And uh, the people who actually protected them were the Arab neighbors who mm -hmm. hid them and uh, let them uh, let them stay in their own houses. Uh, until things got a little bit, uh, a little bit more settled. Libya, if the war would have continued, Libya's Libyan Jews would have been uh, wiped off the face of the earth. So uh, at the end of the war, more than 700 uh, Libyan Jews were killed by the Nazis, either in concentration camps in Libya or in Europe. Uh, but that was the plan for all of the Jews of, of uh, Libya, Libya. And uh, fortunately, the war ended up there a bit earlier and the British were able to take over in 1942, I believe. So they were spared uh, that way. Life was just a little bit better uh, until uh, 1945 where there started to be riots and pogroms against Jews in Libya, especially in, um, in Tripoli, in the big city. Um, the Jews of Libya were always Zionists. There was a strong Zionist movement uh, in, in Libya uh, at the beginning of the um, 19th century. There were youth movements. They learned Hebrew at school, especially the boys. Uh, and that's, I guess, just added to the fear and to the notion that uh, their life in Libya uh, was not going to last uh, anymore, even though it was one of the oldest Jewish community in the world. Uh, and uh, yeah, so after the, the riots and the pogroms of 1945, there were riots and pogroms in 1948, uh, and of course in 1967. So today there are no Jews living in Libya at all.